Hi, my name is Jennifer Kuykendall, and I'm the Executive Director of the Wayne County Museum here in Goldsboro, North Carolina. Today I'm going to take you on a virtual tour of our special exhibition, The Immigrant Experience in Wayne County. And these virtual tours are made possible through an NC CARES grant um, by the National Endowment for the Humanities and the North Carolina Humanities Council. The NC CARES Act enables us to continue to bring you programming even while we're closed during the pandemic. So we'll take you on a tour. I think most people, when they hear immigrant experience, most Americans tend to associate immigration with the U.S.-Mexican border. But in fact, in reality, immigration can happen anywhere on our border. Um, Traditionally, I think most people have thought of immigration when they think of a location as Ellis Island. Um, Ellis Island, and we have images of that in the exhibit, um, is a place where most of the ships came. Uh, it's an island off of New York, and immigrants came there, were processed, and moved on from there to um, other parts of the country. Um, by Ellis Island, there in the harbor, is the Statue of Liberty. And the Statue of Liberty is often um, the first thing that immigrants would see that came by ship to America. And the Statue of Liberty became a symbol of freedom, of democracy, and the American dream uh, for most immigrants. So we want to talk about um, some of the immigrant groups and the history of early Wayne County and then uh, continue up until the present day. So originally, one of the oldest groups of immigrants, not just to Goldsboro, but to the colonies, um, were immigrants from Germany. Um, locally, um, the Wheel family uh, are a group of German immigrants that we hear quite a bit about because they were very, very successful entrepreneurs in the city and great philanthropists as well that gave um, a great deal uh, to the city. Um, German immigrants in general have really made up not just part of our city, but a part of our American culture. Um, during the time of the colonies, German immigrants made up a full one third of the population of the colonies. So German culture is deeply, deeply ingrained in American roots. We get our concepts, uh, Christmas concepts from the Germans, our idea of Santa Claus bringing gifts. Uh, the Christmas tree is a German um, tradition. And also the Easter bunny is a German tradition. So Germans uh, have a long history here in the United States and um, have made great impact here. Um, the Wheels, in particular, came and created a business empire. Uh, the Brothers Wheel opened uh, their department store in 1868, I believe. They arrived here from Stuttgart, Germany in um, 1858. So they came and they created not just the department stores, but they created um, what was the armory of the department stores that has become the Paramount Theater. Um, the Brothers Wheel um, donated the oldest and largest park, uh, probably the most popular park in Goldsboro, um, in honor of their late brother Herman. He died early, um, and so to honor them, they gave um, Herman Park to the city, um, which has a fountain with a statue, the lady in the park, and we have the real original right here um, in the lobby of the museum. Um, they also gave, it's a two-parter, uh, Gertrude Wheel, who was Henry Wheel's daughter, um, was a member of the Goldsboro Women's Club. She and her mother, Minna Wheel, uh, created the Women's Club, and they built this very building that now houses the museum. They did all sorts of stuff for the city. They fought for women's rights to vote. Um, and Henry Wheel's widow, or Solomon Wheel's widow, rather, um, gave his home to the city, uh, and it became the first public library here in Goldsboro. And we have pictures of the interior um, of the house when it was the library. Um, the Wheels, like a lot of the German immigrants that came um, to North Carolina, were Jewish. Uh, they were Jewish immigrants, and they originally met 
interesting. Um, on the third floor of the armory, that is now the Paramount Theater, until they built their own synagogue, Temple Ohab Shalom, which is um, built after uh, the Temple Ohab Shalom in Baltimore. Um, it's the second oldest synagogue in the state. The first oldest is in Wilmington. Um, so aside from the synagogue, from all of the philanthropic work um, that the Wheels did, um, there are also other Germans that you might hear less about, um, like the Bonnitzes. Um, John Henry William Bonnitz uh, was an immigrant who came here. He built uh, the Bonnitz Hotel. Uh, which was a very grand hotel, which no longer exists today. He also built the Messenger Opera House. Uh, he had the Messenger newspaper. The Messenger Opera House um, was three stories tall at one point, but Hurricane Hazel knocked down the two top two floors. At one time, apparently, the stage area could hold up to 900 people for live performances, musicals, plays, etc. Um, and so he built a lot of stuff um, here in Goldsboro. He also had the first German language newspaper. My German is terrible, um, but it was called the Sudlich or the Southern Post, the Sudlich Post. And so it was a German um, newspaper right here in Goldsboro. And there were so many German immigrants that almost any city of any size had its own German newspaper. Um, and we had our own right here in Goldsboro for a time. Um, we have interviews with um, more recent German immigrants. In almost every case, we have a personal interview with someone who came to this country from another country um, and became a, a U.S. citizen and kind of their story about what it was like, uh, their personal experiences, their journey, etc. So it really makes it a personal, not just pictures, but when you can read somebody's real story, it makes them not so much, you know, the other or a mystery immigrant, um, but it makes them really very real people and their stories um, are very personal and some of them are incredibly inspiring. So these images, which are very moving, are from a naturalization ceremony that Wayne Community College hosts in the Moffat Auditorium every year. Um, US na naturalization is one of the ways that a non-US citizen can legally uh, become an American citizen. It takes a great deal of study. Um, it takes some money is involved. There are a lot of legal fees um, that you have to pay. but. It's interesting, my friends that I've spoken to who have become naturalized citizens say that they know more about constitutional law and a lot of American history, a lot more than um, most average American citizens do. So it's not easy to become a naturalized citizen. Um, but when they do, and these ceremonies, if you've never been to one, I highly recommend you go because they're incredibly moving. There's usually not a dry eye in the house. Um, because um, they are very, very proud to become Americans. This image actually at the bottom are the parents of one of our Russian immigrants that we interviewed. Um, and everybody um, who has become a U.S. citizen, it's, they say it's um, their proudest moment as an immigrant, that it's the culmination of the American dream. So another way uh, immigrants can become um, American citizens, there are several different refugee groups um, that have been granted um, a special status. Um, refugees in countries where um, the U.S. military um, has had conflicts, um, the people who, indigenous people who have worked with them, whether as interpreters, as guides, once the U.S. military pulls out of those countries, those people are in grave danger of, um, of being killed. And so we do offer um, asylum to some of these different countries. And we have some fantastic um, textiles um, from Afghanistan that were given to us by uh, the former ambassador to Afghanistan, who was a young man from Goldsboro, went to Goldsboro High School, uh, Mr. Carl Eikenberry. Um, he was ambassador to Afghanistan for several years, and he donated a lot of African, 
Afghani cultural items uh, to the museum. So you can see this beautiful heavily embroidered gown is traditional Afghani um, dress. There is also a burqa. Um, this burqa covers you from head to toe, um, just a mesh slit to see out of. You can't see any part of the body. Um, and you usually think of these as being, um, you know, Arab. Um, but the Arab versions are actually black. This one's a bit flashy <laughs> in Afghanistan, so it actually has a pretty color. Um, but those are examples of two cultures um, that have had special um, refugee status. Um, when we talk about um, kind of other countries that have special status, um, Asian Indians are becoming the very fastest growing immigrant group um, in North Carolina. Um, and like um, agricultural workers um, who can get visas um, if status quotas can't be filled by their employers, um, different special um, groups of people with extraordinary talents, or what the visa calls them, whether it's working in the tech industry, um, medical fields, uh, surgeons, um, different doctors, um, they can all come here to fill jobs that can't be filled um, by American citizens. So there is an extraordinarily large um, community of Indians, especially in Cary and Durham, um, and also in Raleigh. They have, actually have a first-run Bollywood movie theater in Cary. Uh, and you can go and see some of the traditional Indian festivals like Diwali um, right there um, in Raleigh. Um, we have some antique dolls, uh, we have some cultural items, and we have an interview um, with a local retired surgeon, Dr. Krishna Prada, um, who is, uh, he's quite a character. And Dr. Krishna Prada tells us um, about his story uh, coming here, his experiences as a surgeon, um, and what that's like as sort of a different immigrant status. Um, but we have uh, really learned a great deal about Indian culture and are excited to share it with you. Okay, another immigrant group that we've been asked about are African immigrants. Um, initially, um, our first African residents in North Carolina and the U.S. Um, were not willing immigrants to the country. Uh, they were a part of the slave trade, so they were basically kidnapped. Uh, and it was human trafficking. Um, but now we are getting um, all different kinds of African immigrants to the United States. Um, locally, um, one very successful entrepreneur who has helped make um, Goldsboro more colorful, literally, uh, is uh, Lillian Danielli, who has uh, a boutique called Nishona uh, in downtown Goldsboro. It highlights a beautiful, uh, very vivid African textiles from Tanzania. Also, she has African jewelry, um, but she's been part of um, the revitalization of downtown and one of many uh, immigrant entrepreneurs who have um, helped make the city more colorful. Um, also, we have Haitian residents. Um, we have immigrants, Haitian immigrants to Goldsboro, but especially Mount Olive. Um, Mount Olive has, has a huge um, Asian, I mean, Haitian uh, immigrant population. And we actually, there's an interview with a city planner, and he talks about how critical um, the Haitian community, uh, the new Haitian community there, has been to the city economically. Uh, they fill jobs at Butterball, they work in agriculture, and now um, they're beginning to open their own um, businesses downtown in some storefronts that had sat empty for years. So they're really helping to revitalize uh, Mount Olive. Um, and I learned in the opposite end of Haiti is the Dominican Republic. They actually share the same island of Hispaniola. Um, and the Dominican Republic is a beautiful um, island nation. Um, they have not experienced the same, as much of the same um, harsh weather um, and earthquakes that um, Haiti has, uh, but they have had their share. 
Um, we have an interview with a gentleman, Dumas Brea, who came here from the Dominican Republic when he was 18 years old with his mother. Um, he became very successful uh, working uh, through, with Mission Foods and could ro relocate anywhere in the country and he chose Goldsboro because he loved the weather here. He thought it was beautiful. And now he actually owns two different restaurants downtown. Uh, there is Up North Pizzeria on Center Street and then on the opposite side of Center Street he owns Briss's, uh, which is a Caribbean uh, Dominican cuisine restaurant. So in the bottom of this case, there's information uh, and interviews with um, another Haitian family um, through Literacy Connection. Literacy Connection is a local resource. They're an amazing resource. They're located on Ash Street, and they work with a lot of different immigrants. Um, they have English as second language programs um, for adults and then also for students as well. Um, and so they teach um, the adults first because they say if your parents don't speak English that it's that much more difficult uh, for children to learn to become fluent. So they work with different, um, all different groups of um, immigrants um, to perfect their English skills. They also help um, native residents of North Carolina um, with their literacy skills as well. We're gonna talk about Greek immigrants. Um, Goldsboro has had a large Greek population um, come and probably the most popular, the most well-known was a gentleman um, named Bill Palancis. He immigrated to the United States when he was 15 years old. He came um, from Greece where he was a shepherd uh, from a very poor region of the country. Um, so as a shepherd, it was, he had to save up money because at that time to come through Ellis Island, um, you had to have enough money to prove that you could support yourself. You also had to have the name and address of an employer so that you had a job to go to because they didn't want you to be a burden on society. Well, young Bill, 15 year old Bill knew this. He saved up enough money to get a $20 bill, which was how much you had to have um, to show that you were solvent to come through Ellis Island. He was so scared that that $20 bill was gonna be stolen um, that he folded it up and put it inside his shoe. Um, and he slept in his shoes for the entire duration of the trip to Ellis Island and it wasn't like it was you know several hours like a trip might be now but it was several weeks that he slept with a $20 bill in his shoe um, and protected the $20 bill saved it and he went on to become a very successful entrepreneur. Um, Mr. Palancis uh, came he worked for another Greek immigrant um, at the uh, a cafe across from the terminal hotel by the train station. Uh, he saved up his money, he perfected his English, um, and he eventually opened his own restaurant called Central Lunch. Uh, Central Lunch was a very, very popular um, cafe downtown for decades and decades. Um, he served basic American fare, it was not Greek fare, it was hot dogs, hamburgers, um, basic um, food that appealed to the local palate. Um, and he, he was known to, um, to treat people to food. A policemen apparently never had to pay. They got coffee and donuts for free. And he was actually involved in some interesting um, history of Goldsboro. Um, There's something called the derailification that happened um, in the 1920s where locals pulled up some railroad tracks that ran down Center Street, the business district. Uh, the tracks were in disuse, um, but the railroad company um, did not want to pay the money to pull them up. So the citizens of the town, under the cover of darkness, um, pulled them up illegally. And um, that night they worked all night in the dark. Mr. Palancis kept Central Cafe open to provide coffee, donuts, sandwiches, and a clean bathroom um, for anybody that was helping um, to in this derailification process that then really helped downtown to grow. Um, 
he also, he was a great patriot. He loved America. Um, we have certificates where he donated to several causes. He donated money for the restoration of the Statue of Liberty in the early 1980s when she had fallen into disrepair because he remembers seeing her um, at Ellis Island when he came over and um, what she meant to him. And so he donated uh, money to that cause. Um, he also, um, there's an article in the newspaper in the 1940s, um, again, because he was very patriotic, he, the war bond sales were going slowly. And so he purchased a $1,000 war bond. Well, the newspaper got wind of it. They put him on the front page basically saying, hey, this immigrant can buy a $1,000 war bond, then certainly you can too. So um, basically, the, he inspired people and the newspaper kind of shamed them. And then after his big um, war bond purchase, the war bond sale skyrocketed. So there are all kinds of articles about him. Um, we have his ship's manifest where he came over from Greece. There are also a couple of framed um, newspapers from his hometown in Greece. Uh, we have the translations, but basically it talks about how like a local boy has made good in the United States. Um, and we have everything from, we have pictures of the interior of the restaurant, um, the signs, the old menus. Um, so the Greeks have, have definitely um, left an imprint on Goldsboro. Okay, Chinese immigrants, um, Immigration from China um, became very prevalent um, during the gold rush uh, in California in the mid-1800s. Um, the Chinese came um, for, to pan for gold, but also they worked on the railroads, uh, they worked in mining, they worked on a variety of large label, labor products, and worked their way from the West Coast to the East Coast. So Goldsboro had um, a beloved Chinese immigrant named Mr. Sam Lee, who came from Canton, China, and owned Sam Lee's Laundry downtown for decades and decades and decades. Um, but what we found out when we were doing research is Sam Lee was probably not his real name, and that there were many, many cities that had Sam Lee laundries. Um, Sam Lee was kind of a pseudonym that was taken on by a variety of Chinese immigrants. Uh, Sam Lee literally means triple profits, so it was a lucky um, name for a business to have. And so there were many Sam Lee laundries that weren't necessarily run by Sam Lees. Um, our Sam Lee, uh, that was not his real name, as we found out. Um, so he came, he worked in um, his laundry. Uh, he retired at the age of 84, and he had sent most of his money back to uh, Canton because he had a wife in Canton, China. Um, but because of the restrictive uh, immigration laws at that time, uh, which were very anti-Asian, he could not bring his wife over, um, and so he spent sent all of his money um, abroad. And so when he had to retire at the age of 84, because laundry work is very physical, um, he was kind of in bad shape physically and financially. Um, but the locals who had, uh, you know, had a warm place in their heart for him um, helped support him financially. There were two different families that took him in and let them um, live in their homes. Um, and so he um, was in the newspaper, there are a couple of different articles uh, about him, and we tracked down his grave. Um, when we, did, we were doing research, it said that he was reported to be buried locally, but they couldn't, the blog that we were reading couldn't prove it. So we went and tracked down his grave. He is buried at Willowdale. We took a picture of his grave, and his grave has a beautiful inscription in English, but we noticed down the side of it um, is Chinese script. It's, it's can't, written in Cantonese. And we had to uh, get a translator to help us uh, because Google Translate was no help at all. Um, but it literally says in Cantonese, tomb of our father, the 15th generation of our family, whose style name is Shangrong and pseudonym Wugong. So those are his real his his real uh, first and last name. Um, and so 
he's buried right here. Uh, he stayed here. Um, and the difficulty he had uh, not being br able to bring his wife over um, became not an is so much of an issue because in 1945 um, there was an immigration act passed called the War Bride Act, and that War Bride Act allowed um, military servicemen to bring their spouses uh, that they had met and um, married in other parts of Asia um, to bring them home to the United States. So initially Japanese war brides, then uh, Korean war brides during that conflict, and um, Vietnam war brides. So we have items um, from some of all of the different uh, groups of war brides. And they faced um, quite a bit of um, hostility when they came over. We have interviews um, with a couple of these war brides, one of whom is my mother-in-law, uh, who was recently passed, but she came over um, from Japan with her husband, and she said that um, people were not very friendly to her at all. And you can imagine having, you know, that your enemy suddenly becoming your neighbor, how difficult that might be for you know some um, Americans to wrap their heads around. Um, now apparently it is much easier uh, for brides who come over, and many of them, um, the younger brides, have said that um, the military kind of make a community, and the military. Um, residents are much more accepting of other cultures because there's so many people from so many countries that have ended up there. But so we have items from um, antique items from all over Asia, and they're fascinating. Um, we have uh, some successful entrepreneurs from Asia here. Uh, Jay Shin, the Jay Shin Restaurant uh, Group. Uh, his hometown is Seoul, Korea. Um, downtown, we have uh, the Puns, who own um, the Thai, Thai Garden Cafe and a very delicious restaurant. So they've all kind of helped to, um, to make our, definitely our food scene more interesting, um, but our culture as well. For this exhibit, um, like some of the others that we've done, um, we created a kid's culture corner. So here, especially after seeing all these beautiful uh, national costumes, um, we figured kids would really like to literally try on a different culture. So we have a little of everything. We have things from Japan, from Mexico, from Africa um, that they can try on. And then we have a reading table so that they can learn more um, about other cultures. There's everything from um, kids' book about Tanzania, the story of Mexico, Diwali, Japanese traditions, um, Day of the Dead, um, things that kids um, seem to particularly be interested um, about other cultures. So they can sit here and, and read more and, um, and you know, try, try a little dress up and have some fun. We have many um, Lebanese immigrant families in Goldsboro. And a very interesting fact about all of the different families that um, make Goldsboro their home is that most of them all came from the very same village in Lebanon called Hamana. Um, and so one group, you know, one family would come over and become successful and would tell the people back in the village, like, oh, you've got to come to the United States, you know, and like many other groups, they heard, oh, the streets are paved with gold, and you just have to come and work hard, and you will make money. And the Lebanese um, certainly did that here in Goldsboro. Um, one of the earliest Lebanese families were the Badours, and uh, Shikri Badour uh, came here when he was very young with his sister, um, and he moved, they moved to Mount Olive, and he saw cucumbers rotting in the field. And so he said, there's got to be a way that these won't be wasted. So he, in 1926, um, basically started brining some of these leftover um, cucumbers so that they could try to you know, market them or find a way um, that farmers who had leftover cucumbers that they couldn't sell, um, that they could do something else with them. Well, he began Mount Olive Pickle Company. Um, 
And it became the number one pickle company in the United States. And in fact, next year, 2021, will be its 95th anniversary. So Mount Olive Pickles became very, very big. Um, and so the Badours became very involved uh, in philanthropy, in community involvement. Uh, they were very involved in local um, politics and um, community service. Um, some of the other families uh, from Lebanon who also came um, were, and you can see here, the Josephs, the Mansours, uh, the Farfors, and we'll look at some pictures of those families. But they have brought, um, the interesting thing about the Lebanese um, immigrants here is they maintain their Lebanese roots. They go back quite often. They keep in touch with their families there. Um, and the town or the village of Hamana, uh, where they come from, is where they all go back. And there is a, a Hamana society here uh, that's made up of all of the different um, families who came from that one village uh, in Lebanon. So there's a, we'll see a picture of that later, too. Okay, in this case, um, we have more Lebanese immigrants. Um, that it's interesting that um, a lot of the Lebanese immigrants who came became very successful merchants. Um, and the Farfors, the Mansours, uh, they had department stores. Uh, Neil Joseph had one of the very most elegant ladies' uh, boutiques uh, in downtown. Um, and in fact, we have several photographs of the interior of Neil Joseph's. And they look like movie set photos. And in the other gallery, um, it's too heavy to move in here, we have Neil Joseph's cash register. And it is enormous and it's beautiful. Like It's like the Rolls Royce of cash registers. Um, but very, very elegant shop. Um, so they were, yeah, merchants who became very, very successful. There was like the hub, um, popular local store, uh, and St. Mary's. The history of the Lebanese is very involved in St. Mary's Catholic Church. Uh, it was a Roman Catholic Church, um, originally built um, by immigrants from Germany, Ireland, and England, but the Lebanese came later, and most of them were Maronite Catholics. And so they that was the next wave of worshipers at um, St. Mary's Catholic Church. So we have some beautiful photos of a uh, Lebanese wedding inside the church. And the 50th anniversary of St. Mary's, which was in 1939. Um, it's right across the street from us, so we, um, we have a great love for the church. Um, but so you can see, these are some of the um, Lebanese families. And from those Lebanese families, we have some beautiful um, traditional costumes. These are on loan um, by Margaret and Phil Badur. This is a beautiful women's uh, brocade gown. And you can see the traditional headdress that um, ladies keep their heads covered. Um, men do too. This is a traditional men's Lebanese outfit um, from Phil Badur. And you can see it, um, it's, it's very cool. It's designed because it, it can be very hot there. But you can see um, head coverings for men and for women. And then um, behind this costume is actually uh, an image of the village of Hamana, where almost all of the Lebanese immigrants uh, to Do Goldsboro and Wayne County came from. Hispanic immigrants uh, are one of the largest immigrant groups in Wayne County. And we've learned um, quite a bit in researching this exhibit uh, about uh, our Latin neighbors, um, but especially um, our neighbors um, from Mexico. And so you see this incredible dress. It looks like a cross between a, a prom dress and a, and a wedding gown. Well, this is part of um, one of the most important um, cultural traditions. Um, it's called quinceañera. And the quinceañera is um, a coming of age ceremony. It's like a sweet 15 
um, is the closest uh, you know, kind of um, thing that we have Sweet 16 here, but it has a religious component so that it's more like a, like a bat mitzvah uh, coming of age. So the ceremony itself has two parts. There is a mass, so there is a religious component. Uh, and then after the mass, there is a huge party. So there is a fiesta component uh, with music, traditionally uh, mariachi bands, um, there's a father-daughter dance, um, and symbolic of the transition of the young woman um, from girl to womanhood um, is an exchange of shoes. She wears flats, and at one point in the festivities, the father brings her high heels, and she changes from her flat shoes into her high heel shoes, and that is the transition of the girl to the woman, which is a wonderful symbolism, I think. Um, these dresses are incredible. You can see this dress belonged to a local girl, Ashley Morales, who was kind enough to loan us her dress. And these dresses often cost as much as wedding dresses. They are spectacular. Um, they, there's a rebozo involved, which is kind of a shawl for modesty. Uh, and there's flowers and a crown. Um, they're all a part of the traditional uh, quinceanera ensemble. So many local Hispanics are naturalized citizens. Um, some have been here for several generations now. Um, and then others are what are called guest workers um, or migrant workers. They actually come um, during a portion of the year to do agricultural work and then repatriate to Mexico. And usually they work under sometimes some pretty harsh conditions and they try to spend as little money as possible here because they send most of it um, home to their families. Um, we have interviews um, with a gentleman, well actually with several different um, seasonal um, agricultural workers. Uh, that were arranged from a group um, called FLOC, which is the Farm Labor Organizing Committee here locally, um, that helped them get settled, that helps them um, figure out where to shop, um, it helps them with translation, with some English lessons. Um, and they arranged for us to interview um, several guest workers in their program. And their stories are very, very moving. Um, there's a story of a girl who's mother um, brought her to the United States and she just graduated high school and she said her mother um, walked in the field so that she could walk um, across the stage and get her diploma. Um, there's also a young man who's been working in the tobacco industry uh, for years um, and then uh, another gentleman who answered every interview question we had and it's interesting because he takes all the money he makes, he sends it home. His dream is to build a house in his hometown in Mexico. And so he says every year he takes all the money he makes, takes it home, and every year his basically back-breaking labor he does here helps he and his family get a little bit closer um, to their goal of building a dream home. Um, and so that's been interesting to me in all of the different interviews that we've done, the different, no matter which country they're from, uh, the immigrants want us to know that they are just like us. They want the same things we want. They want um, you know, the dream of their owning their own home. They want their families to be healthy and happy and have opportunity and a good education and so we're not that much different and so that's what many of them um, have told me. Uh, this particular gentleman said you know that I'm not here to take your job. I am doing jobs that you don't want and that's true. The way the only way that some of these um, large companies, large agricultural companies, large farms, um, butterball turkey, etc can get visas to bring these workers over is they have to um, post basically job listings, uh, you know, help wanted ads in English and Hispanic newspapers uh, for at least three months. And if they can't fill their quota um, through those means, then they can get permission uh, through immigration 
to send inquiries out and hire um, workers um, for guest visas is what they're called. Um, and so uh, I think so many people um, don't realize the importance especially of um, guest workers in um, the agricultural fields is because without them our food would just be rotting in the fields. These are jobs that are really, really difficult and most people don't want to do. Um, and so without our, you know, our guest workers, um, we would not have food on our table. Um, in, also in doing research, we learned quite a bit about um, things that fascinate Americans about Mexican culture. Um, one of them is Day of the Dead. That seemed to be a question that came up over and over. It is not, we learned, a Mexican Halloween. Uh, it's actually one of the most important religious holidays in Mexico. And it is a celebration of life. It is a celebration of death. And a celebration and a time to, to remember um, your lost relatives. You might create um, uh, an altar for them with some of their favorite foods, pictures of them, candles, uh, and it's a time to remember them and celebrate their life, tell funny stories um, about them, and, and just remember them. So Day of the Dead is much more complicated and much older uh, than Halloween. It goes back 3,000 years uh, to Mesoamerican um, cultural traditions. So, so it's, it's much more, um, than just you know the sugar skulls and um, and the decorations uh, that we think of. So these incredible photos that you you see throughout the gallery um, celebrating uh, Mexican heritage are by uh, photographer and filmmaker Lauren Vied Allen, uh, who's very talented. Um, these photos are of a local dance group uh, called uh, the Ballet Folklorico de Colores. And it's a celebration of um, Hispanic culture. Uh, it's a youth group. They are part of 4-H. They learn about Hispanic culture, Hispanic traditions, and then they also kind of educate and engage the local community um, to appreciate uh, Mexican heritage. Um, they're an incredible dance group. Each different costume and dance represents uh, a different region or state of Mexico. And this right here is their director, and that is Sara Flores Vied. Um, she's the director. Um, she makes, she organizes a group, they um, rehearse, they usually have performances all over, really all over the state. And during um, Hispanic American uh, Heritage Month, they are booked just night and day, night and day, night and day. Um, right now, because of COVID, they are not able um, to rehearse, but they are gonna come during this exhibit for a meet and greet night, and they're gonna come dressed in their costumes. Uh, Ms. Uh, Vied will be here um, with them, and they're going to explain their costumes, um, you know, in masks, uh, in social distancing. Um, they won't be allowed to perform, but you can at least see the incredible costumes um, and meet the kids. They are fascinating. They know a tremendous amount uh, about Mexican culture. All they have grown up right here as natives of, um, of Goldsboro and Wayne County. So we've had Russian, Dutch, Russian, Dutch, Czech, Swiss, Polish, and Latvian immigrants uh, that have all come to Wayne County and Goldsboro specifically. Um, we have an interview with a Russian lady who came here um, and has her own bakery. The one thing that she said she missed was the bread in Russia. Um, and that seems to be a unifying um, Thing that a lot of immigrants uh, have told me, that the one thing they miss are foods from their native country. Um, and so we are going to explore um,
different recipes and different foods. We originally were going to have um, kind of an international uh, food night, but because of COVID, that's going to get postponed. But we do have um, a place where you can sit and look at cookbooks um, from other countries and other cultures and get an idea of those foods from home that some of those groups miss. Um, we have locally, um, there are a lot of old families in Goldsboro that um, are immigrants. Um, the leaders who, uh, the Leader Brothers Department Store, you're probably familiar with, um, they came from Poland. They were Polish immigrants. Um, the Helig Meyer Furniture Company, uh, which became, you know, the, one of the biggest uh, furniture companies um, in the state, um, was formed by two Latvian brothers, um, which I was not aware of. Um, Czechoslovakia, we have lots of Czechoslovakian uh, immigrants um, that came um, with the fall of the Soviet Union. Um, a lot of Eastern European immigrants uh, came when that country kind of economically uh, destabilized. Um, Swiss immigrants have a very, very long history um, in North Carolina and Goldsboro. Um, Swiss immigrants were actually actively recruited um, to come here to work for agriculture. Uh, in 1868, there was a labor envoy named William Atkins who went to Switzerland. Um, he has all kinds of his documents are available on um, NC archives. But he went specifically to recruit Swiss workers to come and do agricultural work. Um, and convinced them that it would be great and they would love it, um, which we assume they did. Um, we have an interview with a lady from Switzerland who immigrated here um, in the 1960s. And she, talking about being an immigrant, is, you know, she also told us that we're the same as you. Um, but she also had some interesting views. She said that every um, country, every culture that has developed economically develops to a point that there are jobs its natives no longer want to do, and those are outsourced to immigrants. So like agricultural work, she says that even the Swiss aren't making Swiss cheese anymore, that all of the dairy and cheese industry is now done by Polish immigrants in Switzerland. So we thought that was interesting, um, how many similarities uh, you know, different countries have in terms of immigration. But we, um, we hope that this exhibit gives you a better appreciation for the other cultures that help make up our local culture um, historically and currently. Um, that when you hear someone with a foreign accent in the grocery store, um, like one of the girls said, please be patient. Um, you know, it only takes a moment of patience uh, to really be kind to others um, and to make their um, transition to Americans easier. So, um, we have a great respect uh, for all these different cultures. And these people who have been brave enough to leave their countries, you know, often with nothing, and come here and start over. So that is the immigrant experience in Wayne County.